Please, please, by all means, check those calendars, get those calendars, and check the Facebook pages. We have um, a water baptism today. Um, amen. And amen. I know, I know that we do water baptisms on four Sunday, but this one was um, an urgent request, and we don't play with that. So if there's anyone else that desires to be baptized today, I know you don't, may not have clothes, but the water is troubled, and we have towels, so you'll be okay, all right? We live in the desert. By the time you get in the car, you might be dry. You'll be okay. All right? but, but for sure, we do have one where the Sarge, Thomas Head, will be baptized today. Amen. Yeah. Um, Brother Eddie. Brother Eddie's not in here. He's Brother Eddie's one of our greeters. Uh, he's the, uh, the ball head man, stands at the front door. But um, there's going to be a Veterans Day ceremony on. November 11th, it's a Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. And Brother Eddie has been instrument, he's been an integral part of putting this thing together. And so those that can make it November 11th, Tuesday morning, 9 a.m., please just go to the park, Veterans Park, and uh, support him and pay homage to our veterans. Um, I'll be doing the invocation prayer, and I just want us there just to support him, because he's part of us, right? He's part of, he's part of our family. And it would do him so well to know that Word of Life showed up to support him. So it only lasts about 25, 30 minutes. Um, at the most, right? So if you are able to come, please come out and meet us. And finally, finally, um, I'll, we'll, I'll be putting out a blast through Elder Franklin and Minister Tim to all the men. Um, we are going to uh, launch uh, a mentorship program here from the church for our boys that are troubled in this community. Um, I was at, yeah, it's time, it's time. I was at, some of you all know, uh, because of work, I'm at the football games. And I was at the game this last Friday, and there was an altercation getting ready to happen um, with some boys who were on the exclusion list versus some boys that were in the game. And they, they had to call police, they had to call security. And some of these boys are boys that I've worked with on a weekly basis for the last two and a half, three years, and now they're older, and they, they still don't understand that some of their decisions will haunt them for the rest of their lives. But what the Lord showed me on Friday, after I pulled uh, three of them away, it's almost to the point where they hate to see me coming because they know what I'm going to say, right? And I pulled three of them aside and the Lord showed me, he said, it's not that these boys are bad. These boys don't have hope. They don't, they don't know life outside of these four walls of this city. And so it's going to be upon you and the brothers at the church to show them that there is more than just go to high school, play football, drop out, or graduate, and then just hang out at A Street Park all day long. And so I'm going to put a call out to the men. 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 Somebody say men. Men. Say it one more time. Men. Men. Men, we need you. We need you. We need you. We're not going to ask you to be committed to multiple hours a week, but we are going to ask you to be committed to lend your expertise. Lend your trade. I want to, we want to teach these boys life skills. We want to teach them how to change the oil in their car. Uh, Y'all can teach me that, actually. Uh, we, want to, we want to teach these boys how, how to change a tire. We want to teach these boys how to dress and prepare for an interview. We want to teach these boys how to carry themselves because, believe it or not, when they walk on campus, if anything goes wrong, they're the first ones that everyone looks at. Yeah. We got to do better than that. We got to do better. So, men, we're going to put a text blast out. We're going to ask for you to meet with us. If we have to do a Zoom, I'm okay with that, but I want to get this implemented and launched in January. The good news is we already have access to the high school, so we just have to show up, amen? We already have access on the high school, we just have to show up. Are y'all with me? Can we do that? All right, I'm sorry. If you're not a man, I need you praying for the men. All right, I need you to pray for that. I need you to pray for the men. Thank you. Listen, um, cell phone, $7. Let's go. Let's go. Um, I, please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. Thank you. I don't have a green thumb. You know what a green thumb is? Yes. 
people that can plant gardens and stuff, right? And so when we recently moved, uh, I said, look at the backyard. Maybe we can put a garden in there. And I'm sure she looked at me like I was crazy, because she know good well. I don't know anything about gardening. And neither does she, and neither does Kayla. And that just wouldn't work. We have a two-year-old Rottweiler who was my size. He would just tear everything up if we put it out there anyway. But the reason I don't plant gardens sometimes, and I think some of us can, can recognize this, is either A, we feel like we'll waste our time because it'll take years and nothing will grow. Or B, something does grow, and then we get eager because it's growing and we end up killing it with overwatering it. Anybody have a plant that you just killed because you watered it too much? Right, I think somebody bought me in the church a plant for Father's Day. And I love you, thank you so much. That plant was gone in three weeks because I was watering it. <laughs> I watered the devil out of it, right? And so the, 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 pro, the point we're trying to make is sometimes we get frustrated with planting seeds and waiting on harvest. Harvesting is, is, a, is a long process. It takes some patience. And I don't want us to think that we're only talking about planting natural seeds because today I want us to look at planting spiritual seeds. We're still at a point in this ministry where God is preparing us for evangelism. He's preparing us to go out there and evangelize the lost, not just invite them to church, but actually invite, invite them to a program of discipleship. Going out there, reaching the lost, because the world is coming to an end sooner than what we believe. Amen? And so when it comes to evangelism and planting these seeds, some of us get frustrated because like me with the green thumb, we say it's not going to work because it's going to take too long. I don't have that kind of patience. And I, you know, I said the word to her and now she's still acting a fool and all that kind of stuff. But 2 Peter 3 and 9 says the Lord isn't really slow about his promise. He's patient for your sake, hoping that all may come to repentance. I give you that scripture because I want us to have the mindset that the Lord has with us. He's not slow concerning his promise, but he's patient. He's hoping that we all will come to repentance. And so for those of us that are going out in these streets and going to our families, we have Thanksgiving coming. And we're going to be united with family around a dinner table who are not saved. And we, 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 and we give them the word. And before the, the, the Thanksgiving dinner ends, they cuss and they smoke and they do whatever they do. And we want to condemn them when the Lord is saying, just plant the seed and be patient. Even though, even when we run into those who know the word like we know the word, and they still won't change, and they want to confront us with the word. Uh, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, he says, opponents must be gently instructed. Meaning that we can't even be out there arguing with people. Because how can you win, and, and I've said this at one of our classes before, I said you can win the argument and lose the soul. You can win the argument and lose the opportunity to evangelize. But then there's another component of this where we get frustrated. Because for whatever reason, we want to mark off discipleships like they're notch notches on the belt. Like we're going to get extra credit because we got more people saved than the next person got saved. And so we want to go out and say, I did this and I did this. I, the word says that one plants and one waters and God brings the increase. Right? They might have accepted Jesus because you mentioned it to him, but somebody had already come along and planted the seed. And so we need to get to the point with evangelism where it doesn't matter who gets the credit. As long as God gets the glory. stop pumping our heads up because somebody got saved at the grocery store because we mentioned Jesus to them. Baby, you just happened to be at the right place at the right time. You might have seen the increase, but you weren't there when the seed was planted. Okay, are y'all with me? And so the thing is, we are trying to impact the kingdom of God. And what I found out is people talk about the kingdom, and they talk about the kingdom, and people leave asking, well, what exactly is the kingdom? What does kingdom mean? What does the kingdom of God mean? The kingdom of God is not some weird futuristic event. Right, right. The kingdom of God is here amongst us right now. Amen. The kingdom means, it's a, it's a Greek word, means basilia. It means, it means kingdom and sovereign rule by a ruler. Who's our ruler? Wow. Okay, see, so y'all with me so far. Good, y'all went to Sunday school. We okay. Luke chapter 17, the disciples asked Jesus, the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus said the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to know that it's coming because it already exists among you. Amen. The kingdom of God is here. Amen. Well, this, how does that make sense? How is the kingdom of God here when Satan runs the world? I hear somebody asking this. Come on, come on. Philippians 3.20, Paul says that we are citizens of heaven. So we're here, but we're citizens of heaven. I have a trip that's coming up soon where we have to go to Pennsylvania. I'm in Pennsylvania. But I'm a citizen, resident of California. Come on. Yeah, got it. Okay. So while I'm in Pennsylvania, I need to go and do what I'm hired to do in Pennsylvania. Right. But once my job is done, I need to come on back to California. Right. Y'all with me so far? Yeah. 
Because we are not citizens of earth, we're citizens of heaven. We're only here for a sign. Problem is, some of us are on vacation. When God has called us to be on earth, there's a sign there. Well, then what's my assignment? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, Paul says we are ambassadors of Christ in a foreign land. Do you know what an ambassador it is? An ambassador is somebody who is sent to a foreign country on behalf of the king. And when they get there, it's literally saying the king can't be here, but I'm in his place. What that does is it gives the ambassador every bit of authority that the king would have yeah. had the king actually been there. See, this is what's wrong with us. We don't recognize the fact that we have authority because we are ambassadors here on earth. Why are you bowing down and running from the enemy when first you don't belong in his kingdom, two, you are an ambassador, and because you're an ambassador, three, you have the authority and the sonship of the king. Running around timid and afraid to tell somebody about Jesus because you might get fired or because you might lose friends or because this may happen or because that may happen. You don't understand. I have to tell you about Jesus because my soul is more important than myself. Yes. Jesus said you're going to lose friends because yes. you're preaching my name. You're going to lose family because you're standing for me. Jesus told us that was going to happen, but for whatever reason, we want to circumvent that process. Somebody say ambassador. ambassador. And I have to ask God, I said, why is it that we can't wrap our minds around the fact that we're ambassadors? And the Lord said, because there's so many titles being thrown out. Mm -hmm. Come on. I'm going to help somebody, and I'm going to make somebody else mad. Yeah. So, <laughs> the water is troubled. You can get in and yes. get away from me. Come on, come on. We become attached to titles All right. as opposed to being attached to purpose. Yeah. 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 Purpose is what you're called to do. Okay. Title and gift is what's been given to you to perform that purpose. Okay. So we've been called to be ambassadors. Ambassadors to proclaim that God is good and reconcile man back to God. Some of us have been called to do that with the voice, to sing. Some of us can sing to the point where when we start to sing, dem demons start to tremble and people start to wonder who Jesus is, right? That is your gift, that is your title, but that's not your purpose. Are you with me? Some of us have been given the gift to preach. When we preach the gospel, souls come running to the, to the altar saying, what must I do to be saved? Preacher is not your purpose, preacher is your gift. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, see? Imagine, imagine, imagine if we lived in a church where we stop speaking what we do and start marketing who we are. See, I'm trying to help us because God gave me this word today of evangelism. And when we get out there to evangelize, no one's going to care that your title is bishop. When you got to evangelize, no one's going to care that your title is deacon. Because, because true, see, then this is what I've this is what I've come to find out. We don't know what true evangelism is. We think evangelism is going to somebody else who already goes to a church and tell them that you need to come to my church. And when they come to your church, you say, I witness to them outside, and now that that's not evangelism. You're literally fishing for fish that already have a pump. Some people cry. But I know pastors that do it. You're not witnessing to somebody that's already saved. True evangelism goes into the highways and the hedges. It goes into the crack houses and the street walkers. True evangelism goes to the place where they're gambling and they're drinking. True evangelism goes to the drunkards and the homeless and meets them behind the store where they're laying and they're asking for food. And you say, I have food, but also I have something that you can take now that you'll never hunger or thirst again. True evangelism goes off to the deepest parts, of, to the places where the people don't want in church because they smell and they stink and they look raggedy. True evangelism says, look, forget about my title. I'm an ambassador telling the was trying to explain to these disciples about the kingdom of God because he wanted them to know that everything that we do is to impact the kingdom. I got news for you. If what you're doing is only impacting the church and not impacting the kingdom, you might want to take a second look at what you're called to do. Because he says everything that we're doing is impacting 
impact what? The kingdom. And so we gave these parables, these stories, these, these things that can help them relate and understand what, 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 what the kingdom really was. And in Mark chapter 4, he told them, he said, he, he, the Bible says that he didn't speak to them without using a parable because they couldn't really understand. So we had to break things down to them. He says in Mark 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but it comes the largest of the garden plants. Jesus tried to let them know what you are doing right now you may think is insignificant. But when I come back, you're going to be the largest thing in the field. Amen. Yeah. Amen. He told them again in Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a yeast in a woman, in a, in a, in a, with a woman making bread. He says it may look like a small amount, but it's going to impact the whole loaf. Yes. You may think that telling somebody that Jesus loves you is something small. But if you plant that seed, by the time the fire of life starts to bake that loaf before you know it, they're going to have Jesus everywhere. And so then Jesus says, okay, let me explain something to you. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. He talked about a farmer going out to plant seed. If you want to follow me, go to Mark, Matthew 13, verse 3. He says, listen, a farmer went out to plant seeds and he scattered them across the field. Some fell on a footpath, birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Come on, come on. Still, other seeds fell on fertile soil, yes. and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, oh, 100 fold. God is good. God is good. Anyone with ears to hear should yes. hear to understand. Yes. They're puzzled, they're perplexed, because you're dealing with people that work in agriculture, fishermen, farmers. And I can imagine them saying, Lord, we want to about the kingdom, but you're teaching us how to grow seeds. And Jesus said, that's where you missed it. I'm actually teaching what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like you, Charlotte, you, Joanne. See, I'm not using titles right now. Please don't be offended. I'm just calling out names, all right? You, Joanne, you, Reggie. The kingdom of God is like you, leaving church, leaving Bible study, leaving your devotion, and spreading the word of God everywhere that you go. The kingdom of God is not the church. The church is just a place for equipping for all of us. The kingdom of God is not the Somebody said the kingdom of God, kingdom of God is not the church. Not the church. I, come to church I come to church to get equipped, to get equipped for the kingdom of God. So when people say, well, I can't go to church because I'm not perfect. Well, neither are we. Because we all here for instruction. We all here for a playbook. We all here for something to give us instruction. Because the kingdom of God is not like going to church on Sunday. The kingdom of God is like you, my brother, you, my sister, leaving church, leaving like minded believers, and taking seed, which is the word of God, and throwing it everywhere that you go. Could you imagine if you weren't known as bishop, you were just known as seed spreader? Could you imagine if you weren't known as a man, you were just known as seed spreader? Could you imagine if you weren't known as worship leader, you were just known as seed spreader? This is why the Bible says when we see him, he's not going to say, well done, my good and faithful title. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We fight and push it for titles. It's not going to matter in a few minutes. Yeah, to our visitors, I'm very special. So if, if you want somebody that's not special, let me know. We'll direct you to a normal church with a normal pastor and a normal band. And no, we'll, we'll get you there. But if you want to go somewhere that's crazy and peculiar with some weird, nutted up people for Jesus, this is the place to go. If you want to be somewhere that doesn't care about titles and, and names and all that, this is the place to be. If you want to be somewhere with a bunch of crazy, messed up folks who just believe in the cross, this is the place to be. But if you want perfect Sagitti church, let me know. We will get you right over there. But don't you dare think you come in here and not get your hands dirty. Amen. 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 So, 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 so I'm evangelizing. And Jesus Amen. says, I'm going to spread this seed on four different types of soil. Uh -huh. I want us to be mindful of the fact that I open this message by saying, be patient. Be patient. Yes. Because just because you preached it or taught it or said it don't mean they're going to receive it. As a matter of fact, and I don't know why we get mad with strangers when we got family members who still won't receive it from us. So be, be patient, be patient. She's just the devil. What about your cousin? You've been preaching her for 17 years. She still ain't got it. Okay, so let's.
let's just let's, let's be patient. Let's be patient. Somebody say, be patient. Be patient. Okay, right. You can urge them to say that the Lord is coming, but you can't be pushy like a car salesman. That's why I say, be patient. The first seed that you'll throw, Jesus said, will fall on the footpath. And it won't gain any traction. And so it'll get swept away easily. John 10 and 10, Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's that type of seed that the enemy comes to steal because it has no roots in anything. It can easily sweep it up. But, 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 but even in that, though, I need us to understand that just because it's not received instantaneously does not mean that that person should be discarded. Because you could just be one to plant the seed. And while you're mad, God can send somebody to water that thing. Right? And so, and so this is why you got to keep praying. If you have people in your family who you've been praying for, and for 20, for 30 years, they still have not got saved, baby, don't you stop praying. Because your prayer is a seed. Somebody is coming to water that thing eventually. And if you doubt it, just think about when the Lord found you where you was at. I couldn't speak for nobody else in here, but I was messed up all the way. I was going to church every Sunday, playing instruments every Thursday, and sinning all the way through. I was doing the worst of the worst. I was so going that the man could preach the word, the spirit could run through the church, and I wouldn't feel a thing. Anybody ever been there? When the Holy Ghost hit everybody but you? Just go down the aisle. So that, wasn't, that wasn't just me, okay. That wasn't just me, okay. All right, all right, all right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so you gotta remember that nobody stopped praying for you. Somebody kept you on their heart. Somebody kept you on their mind. Somebody had your name at the top of the prayer list. Somebody didn't before you know it. Somebody came and then watered that seed and the Lord found you. So don't give up on number one. Don't give up on number one. Number two is interesting because this is rocky soil. Now, it doesn't say that the soil can't be penetrated, but it says that it's rocky, so the seed has to compete with other stuff. Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 20, he says, the seed on rocky soil represents those who hear the message and receive it with joy. Ooh, they get it on Sunday, and they shout around the church. Yay. They leave their wig at the altar. <laughs> Dropping crushes, everything else. I mean, just, just messed up, slay it in the spirit. But then they got to go home to reality. And what the dance didn't do for them was give them enough resolve to understand that you're going to have to fight when you get home. See, the thing is, the thing is, we, we mess people up by thinking all you got to do is shout, it's going to go away. And so people are shouting and bucking all around the church, jumping hurdles over the pews, slapping your neighbor high five, spitting on everybody, and leave the church with no power to fight what they got to face at home. You got people that are super saints. I mean, Popeye super saints only have spinach in the church, but don't have nothing out now in rich when they get outside. And so they get this word and they're full of zeal. They're so excited and they get home and they get punched in the mouth. Verse 21, Matthew 13, Jesus says, but since they don't have any deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or if they're persecuted. They, as soon as they have problems, as soon as they have these problems, what I found out is everybody, you, you love everybody when they tell you how great you can preach. But the moment they tell you that you didn't do something right, then you fall away because you were, you were tied to your gift. And you the, the Lord has said, I'm looking for people in this final hour that have been through some things so I know they can go through some things. I'm looking for some people in this final hour that are built for a tough, which means that come what may, go what will, but for God I live and for God I die. I need some people in this final hour that are going to say, I don't care if I have to preach Jesus all by myself and to myself, but everywhere that I go, I'm going to spread seed. I need some people in this final hour that aren't going to get discouraged at the first sight of rejection. They're going to keep on coming. And so, and so, and so, and so, and so Paul said this in Colossians. He says, Colossians 2, verse 6, now that you accepted Christ, you must continue to follow him. Verse 7, let your roots grow down into him. And let your lives be built on him. Why is that important? Thank you, Jeremiah, because Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17 that these people are like a tree that's planted by the water. Have you ever seen a tree that was planted by the water as opposed to a tree that was planted by man? Come on. Let me help you. We had 
Four? Were the Tamarisk trees out here? Are the Tamarisk? Anybody know? The trees in the parking lot. They something. Tamarisk something. They're man made, man planted. And one year, we had a severe windstorm. We got to church, and the one that parked, that was where my wife and I parked, was cracked. We said, oh, whoa, that's okay. And if you look down, me and my wife, we parked in separate areas because she went to the tree that had shade, and I just said, better, I don't care. And so Deacon Bobby and Mr. Tommy went, and they pulled some wire, and they kind of pulled the tree back a little bit. Somebody say, man, man. Man, man. <laughs> man planted, man. then it broke it, and then man made it to stand again. And it was good until the next windstorm came. Next windstorm came, the tree was knocked all the way over. I pull up to the church to go to the office. There's a man out there with a saw. So this will make some good firewood. Like, you didn't even ask permission. But okay, go ahead and do what you got to do. Right. But this was interesting. These trees were planted by man. Just around the corner of the field are trees that were planted by nature and water. The same wind that hit the church hit two miles away from the church. But for whatever reason, the, the plants that were planted at the church are broken, but the ground over there is still standing. This is the thing where you have to be planted in Christ because life is guaranteed to send you a windstorm. Life is guaranteed to send you a rainstorm. Life is guaranteed to send you a tornado. Life is guaranteed to send you a hurricane. Life is guaranteed to tear up everything around you. And if you're not rooted in Christ, you're going to be like a church tree. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so Paul said, let your roots, and I find it interesting, because Paul said, let your roots be planted in Jesus as if they could be planted in something else. Yeah. Well, if it couldn't be planted in something else, what would Paul specifically say, get your roots planted in Jesus? Because Paul knew to the church of Colossae that they were planting themselves into other things. Don't think you're too deep to experience that. Some of us are so planted in our jobs. That if the Lord said, leave the job tomorrow and I'm going to sustain you for three months, we look at the Holy Ghost like he was crazy. Some of us are so planted with our circle that if God does not Abraham with you and says, leave your circle and go to a place that you've never seen before and I'm going to bless you when you get there. Some of us are so messed up with our circle and rooted that God can't even pull us from point A to point B. Talk about Abraham again. God told Abraham, the man that waited over 70 years for his son, to sacrifice him. And Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. But some of us are so attached to the promise and the gift that God gave us to where if God tells us to sacrifice for his sake, we can't because we're rooted in the gift as opposed to the giver. So that second seed of people, there it was. That's why when people get overly excited at church, when they get their breakthrough, somebody needs to link up and do some aftercare and make sure that on Tuesday they're still excited about the Lord. And make sure on Wednesday, because this is what happens. They come and they shout, they dance to victory, but you don't see them again. It's not because they fell in love with Jesus. It's because they took the joy with them and they was choked out by life. Maybe you've never been there before, but I've been there as your pastor. We've had an amazing move of the Spirit, right, right. only to get home and get choked out. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. Okay, yeah. just me and my wife. That's what else's. Y'all so strong. Y'all strong. Y'all even strong. Y'all strong. That's C R O N G. Y'all got it. <laughs> the third type of soil fell on thorns. Jesus said that these are the types, Matthew 13, 22. That hear the word, but it gets crowded out by the worries of this life. He says the worries of this life and the allure of riches. People hear the word, but they feel like it's more to sacrifice, and they're pursuing riches, and they say, I can't do all that. Luke 19 tells the story of a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, Look, I give, I do this, I do that, I want to be in the kingdom. Jesus said, Well, sell everything that you have. And they come follow me. And it said the man walked away sad, frustrated, irritated. Some of us can't serve God because we're serving money. He said, love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. This is my wife right here. Married couples, raise your hand. 
Raise your hand, Mary. Right. What do you think it would be difficult to be totally in love with your spouse and somebody else? Y'all quiet. Wouldn't it be difficult to be all out with your spouse and somebody else? Yes. yes. Thank you, somebody. Thank you. I was worried for a bit. Like, no, I didn't. No, right. uh, when he says all your heart, he said you can't love anything at the capacity that you love me at. Because if you love anything as you love me, then that thing is an idol. And I am a jealous God. There should be no other God standing between you and I. And so when Jesus said that they got the word and it fell on thorns because they worried about life and about chasing riches, he said they can't serve me because they're serving their money. But let me help you. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, right, 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 right. People, people get out there and they throw, you know, money is the root of all evil. That's not what the word says. The word says the love of money is the root of all evil. And God is saying, I don't have a problem with you chasing the bag. Mm. No, I don't. But seek me first. Yeah. <laughs> but then, about the worry part. Matthew 6. Jesus said in Matthew 13 that people can't seek me because they hear the word and they fall over thorns. Uh -huh. Thorns that want them to chase wealth and thorns that have them worried about stuff. Uh -huh. Matthew 6. When Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, verse 33, read the previous five verses. He says, why would you worry about tomorrow? Tomorrow has problems on its own. Yes. Somebody sitting here right now already worried about what's going to happen at work tomorrow. Do you know that tomorrow may not even get here for you or any of us? Tomorrow's not guaranteed. But then I'll take it a step further. A wise man told me that worry is a down payment on a problem that may never happen in the first place. Imagine that you sitting in church, can't worship because you're worried about your co-worker tomorrow, and your co-worker already called off work. You get to work ready to throw hands and let everybody have it. Walks here to put he in in his parking spot, he ain't at his desk. Where is so and so? Oh, he called off work yesterday. Why did nobody tell? Jesus said it wasn't your business. Your business was to worry about yesterday and yesterday. Yeah. And so the thorns, the thorns. Now, 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 now the second seed where, where it gets choked out, that ain't really our fault. Sometimes we just not as strong as we need to be. But the thorns of worry, that, that is our fault. That is our fault. You can't get a breakthrough because your mind is somewhere else. And the Lord is saying, if you just put your mind on me, seek me first, and I'll add everything else to you. Yeah. Here's the final one. Somebody say good soil. Good soil. If you fall into the good soil category, you have a responsibility. Not to enjoy 30, 60, 100 fold, but to bear the infirmities of the weak. Paul said in Romans 15, let the strong bear the infirmities of the weak. When you get to the point, because I think we've all been through these four phases. I think we've all been rocky soil. I think we've all been stubborn. So I think we've all been through that. And then some of us are at number four, where we're fertile ground, where God plants the word in us, and we multiply it. But God did not multiply you for you to keep it to yourself. Matter of fact, God multiplied you so you can give more of you to others. It's a life of service. Amen. And unfortunately, we made it about a life of church. Mm. But it's a life of service. Yeah. Yes. If your target audience that you've been destined for, right, right. that you've been designed and purposed for, never steps foot in the church, mm. would you be able to fulfill your purpose? Mm. Yeah. I'm a preacher, okay. But God called you to prison ministry. God called you to prison ministry. And the prisoners never get released to come to church. Are you able to fulfill your purpose? What that means is, if they're not coming to me, I must go to them. And when I walk into the prison, I got a bag full of seed of the word. And I'm going to spread it everywhere. One part not going to receive it. One part will receive it but can't hold on to it. 
One part can't hold on to it because it got worries and reminders elsewhere, but there will be a part that receives it and they'll duplicate, replicate 30, 60, 100 fold. God wants to use you today. Regardless of where you've been or what you've done, God wants to use you today. Regardless of how insignificant you think that you are, God wants to use you today. God is saying in this final hour, I need all that are willing step up to the plan. Come on, yeah. Come on. Because I don't know if you all are watching the news, but every week something else happens to let us know that the Bible is unfolding right before our very eyes. And now we're at a point where we're moving beyond Matthew 24. We're heading into 1 Thessalonians. I Meaning we're moving beyond wars and rumors of wars, and now we're just looking for the trumpet. Because stuff is going crazy as we speak. And the Lord is saying, everybody's not going to come to church. We're going to have to go get them right where they are. And so if you're here under the sound of my voice, you've been drafted, and now you're accountable to know that you have a responsibility to spread seed everywhere that you go. You may not have all the eloquent speech, eloquence. You may not know all the scriptures, but if you can just point to the cross, you can do your job. Amen. And so if you're here today, and you know that you can do better, you know that you can do more, you know that you have influence with people, and you know that if you just change the tone of your conversation about God, that people will come to the altar, they will come to the cross. If that's you, would you please raise your hand? I just, I, amen, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, this is gonna be a house blessing. That's what I thought, this is gonna be a house blessing. This is gonna be a house blessing. This is gonna be a house blessing. What I love about it was Bishop Taylor raised his hand. Bishop Taylor, I had to raise my hand in my office this morning, and I had to repent because of the Lord, I haven't done all that I can do. And for a man of the cloth to raise his hand and say, I'm a bishop, I have on a purple shirt, I'm wearing a collar, but I know I can do more. What's wrong with the rest of us? What's wrong with the rest of us? Because he understands that collar means nothing once we see Jesus. He understands that this ring means nothing once we see Jesus. He understands God is not looking for a title holder, he's looking for servants. And so we're going to pray, but before we pray, is there one that doesn't know Jesus? I want to make sure everybody's saved before we pray this house. Listen, if you don't know Jesus, you need to be saved. I don't care what they teach you out there, hell is a real place. And it's enlarging itself, the Bible says, meaning, meaning actively enlarging itself. Every day, people are making a reservation to hell. Meanwhile, Jesus says the road to the Father is narrow. Meaning there's only one way. Y'all hear me? It's a whole bunch of ways way to get to God. And so if you're not saved, you understand this, it is now 1158. Noon is not promised. Because he moves in eternity while we move in time. And so at 1158, if you're not saved, then he blows a trumpet at 1159. Most of us, I believe, are going to be with him. And some of us have to be left here behind. Him. If he came in the next 60 seconds, are you sure that when the trumpet starts blowing, stops blowing, you'll be with him? If you're not sure, you need to raise your hand. Is there one that's not saved today? I want to make sure everybody's saved. All right, everybody's saved. Listen, let's pray this prayer. Just repeat after me, and I'm going to go back to my seat. Father, Father it's me. It's me. I know, I know that, I can do that I can do better. Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your grace. And now I receive another chance. Another chance. Give, me Give me the ability, the strength, the strength and, the and the boldness to spread the seed of the kingdom, the of the kingdom. everywhere that I go. That I go. In, Jesus name I In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Okay. Now I can hear myself. All right, we are in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to start at uh, 24. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest he come together for judgment. And the rest I set in order for when I come. I, I get asked about that hungry part a lot because people say, well, it's just a little juice and a tiny wafer. It's not really even a snack. But back in the day, they would assemble at people's homes and they actually had a full meal. And sometimes it was a person of means. And so everybody wanted to go there just, just to eat. We're doing this in remembrance of him. So probably not an issue today. So let's pray. Lord God, and we examine ourselves right now, Father God, and we ask you to remove anything from us that's not of you. We thank you for uh, this sacrament of the Eucharist that we get to participate in, and we ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 